I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. And, and we're, we're Gentry. Gentry. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, Psalm Part 2. And we're doing something out of the ordinary today. We're in studio with Gentry here in Salt Lake, and this is a privilege. Could you introduce yourselves? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm Brad. I'm Casey, and yes, this is where we live. <laughs> this is our home. That's right. That's my bedroom over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I'm Bradley Quinn. And I'm Stephen. So Taylor is joining us remotely tonight because he has tested positive for COVID. This, this is such a, a, an amazing opportunity to be in the studio with Gentry to talk through and let them share some beautiful music as we discuss Psalms uh, 49 through 86. You'll notice as we get into these Psalms how, how you can feel coming off the scripture page these, these ancient writers, even though we don't have any of their music, we don't have any of their tablature, we, we don't know what exact their instruments and their, their melodies and harmonies sounded like, but you can feel this universal language of music coming out of the page because there are times when words alone just don't do it. They don't communicate that depth of the human experience, whether it be remorse, regret, frustration, difficulty, confusion, or praise and conviction to the Lord. So it, it's a unique opportunity to be here as, as you're going to add music that, that we can relate to today to some of these beautiful concepts in antiquity. So again, thank you. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Thank you. So let's jump in. Chapter 49. If you look at a couple of these verses here, verse 6, for instance, it says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. It's this amazing concept that in this, in this world that we live in, this fallen condition, sometimes we put a lot of trust in that money. And we put a lot of energy to, to gaining that money. You'll notice the conclusion in verse 10. For he seeth that wise men die. Likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Hmm. It's that idea of <laughs> you can spend your entire life seeking wealth. But at the end, you're going to die along with everybody else, and you leave that wealth to others. So what an amazing thing to devote a life mm. to trying to build up humanity rather than trying to build up my own kingdom. Yeah, mm. I love that. You know, it reminds me of when I was, uh, when I was a kid, just out of high school, I attended this, uh, this acting school down in Hollywood and had this kind of like really important experience at that age and at that time of my life. And... Uh, you know, kind of long story short, I, I ended up leaving the school because I, I just felt so out of place, uncomfortable. And, and I felt at the time like I was giving something up, you know, like giving something really important up of, of fame or success in the industry because I had this great opportunity and these great connections. And the, the scripture that kept going through my mind the whole time was, what, what does it profit a, a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And, and that has stuck with me my whole life, you know, since then of like, it doesn't matter what, what it is, whether it's a pursuit of success in, in an industry or money or whatever it is, it, you know, our focus should be on, on the things of salvation, you know, and, and, uh, and not the world. It's hard to do, but. I, I love that. And it is hard to do because it's such a pull. Yeah. To, to go after that fame or that money or the honors of the world. But uh, what an amazing thing when you can say, hmm, I love the Lord more than I love all of these things that the world can offer me. And that's kind of the essence as we jump into these Psalms today here in chapter 49. If we jump over to 51, um, this is a really, really profound uh, Psalm. Listen to, to these first words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You can sense the, 
the deep remorse that David feels. We, we know the struggles that he faced and he's turning to God and these words are really powerful. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And he's, in, in the rest of this, this psalm, he's pleading for God's grace to be poured down upon his head. And he's acknowledging, I, I've seriously messed up and I can't fix this and nobody on earth can fix this, but I know somebody who can. And it's, it's profound to, to lay these kinds of things at the feet of the Savior and acknowledge his amazing grace. I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, speaking of amazing grace, when I was in eighth grade, uh, I had just barely gotten into singing. And one of the first songs that I learned, it was a duet, it was me and another guy, was actually a duet version of Amazing Grace. And it was a, about the same time too that personally, I started to explore God and, and get to know him and his son, Jesus Christ, um, going through the seminary program. Because really up until that point, like go to church every week, you know, you do, you check the boxes. But basically, let's be honest, your parents kind of made you do. But now it was time to like start to learn and discover and to experience Christ and his atonement for myself. And, you know, when I think about um, even going back to your comments earlier about wealth, we, we search our whole lives. I feel like it's this constant um, journey of trying to feel fulfilled and satisfied. And, and uh, I think, think there's a reason that we all chase the things of the world, because for a moment, they do satisfy mm -hmm. in, that, in that instant. It's just enough that we feel like, oh, like that, that felt good. And then eventually it goes away, which it always blows my mind, like the super wealthy people of the world um, they're never content. Mm -hmm. It's like, at what point do you have enough? When have you arrived? <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah. like, they, they, they can't. And I, it, it's just this, this insatiable appetite. And yet, um, you know, the most humble, the most, the most meek before God can be completely content. Mm -hmm. um, as, as a student at, at BYU, traveled the world and going to the most humblest of places and seeing some of the happiest people I've ever met. And, and in contrast, being home and, and you know, interacting with folks that will have more than I could ever hope just seemed empty in some regard yeah. is amazing to, to see that contrast. Mm. Your comment makes me think about Lehi. First Nephi chapter eight, he has this dream where he's wandering this wilderness and he, he's seeking God's loving tenderness. These multitude of the tender mercies, what we see in first Nephi eight. And all of us have these opportunities to experience the goodness in the world, but sometimes we also experience the darkness and we need God to give us his tender mercies, to lead us back into the light and remind us about what really matters. And this phrase, thy loving kindness could be translated as grace, this everlasting free gift that God gives to all of us. Yeah, and it's fascinating when you tie this in to, to what you shared as well, Brad. There's a line in the song you're about to sing. When we've been there 10,000 years, it gives us that, that eternal perspective, just the beginning of, a, of an eternal mm -hmm. perspective. And I stop and think about that for a moment. In that, per, for, from that viewpoint, I don't know how many people 10,000 years from now are gonna look back and say, man, I wish I would have earned more money. I wish I would have had more pleasure. I wish I would have taken more vacations. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think many people are going to be focusing on anything that this world had to offer. But when we've been there 10,000 years, right, shining as the sun, we're, we're not going to get tired of singing his praises. Mm. We're not going to get tired of the grace that he offers us, not just in this life, but throughout the eternities. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Thank you. Uh, that, that was so beautiful. Way more impactful than if you just read the, the words to that song alone. That, that music, the piano, the harmonies, the, the melodies all coming together. You can see why the Psalms are the most quoted book from the Old Testament and other scriptures. Mm -hmm. Because it just connects with a deeper level of our humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was amazing. Thank you. If you look now in chapter 51, look at verse 15. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God 
are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. I love that. That song that you just sang kind of embodies that whole idea of, of my heart is broken. I recognize more than ever before who I am, who thou art, and how desperately I need thee. Yeah, I just had a thought. We, uh, I know it's, it's not Christmas time, but one of the, the hymns that we sing is uh, In the Bleak Midwinter. And we talked earlier about, um, you know, obtaining things of this world and how we're all just caught up in this, this, this mad dash of, of wealth accumulation. And yet, you know, hearing you say that, the one thing that God expects from all of us that, that is completely within our control, regardless of our socioeconomic state, is our heart. The one thing we can actually give him. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter, poor, wealthy alike, everyone is capable of that. And it was Elder Maxwell, wasn't it, who said the only unique thing that we actually have to offer on the altar is our heart. It's our will. And it doesn't matter your age, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your nationality, your, your bank account size. We can all try a little harder to do a little better at giving that up. Now, as we, as we uh, skip over a couple of chapters here and, and skip over to chapter 61, he, he picks up a a different idea here that's really profound. Listen to this. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. It's that idea of God is my refuge, my safety tower. And when trouble is coming, I, I know where I can go. It's, it's a really beautiful sentiment, especially as we look at the, the world today with temples dotting the earth and all these safe, safety towers that God has provided for us. Mm. You know, uh, this, uh, this next song that we're going to do, it, it, uh, it's interesting. It actually pulls some of that language uh, into the lyrics and... It makes me think there was a, a time in my life when I was a, a young lad uh, and I, you know, it was, it was a tough time in my life. <laughs> I, was, I was not going on a great path and, and, uh, and I, I got to the point where I started sort of asking this question of like, of God, where art thou? You know, like, I don't, I don't see you in my life. I don't, I can't feel your presence anymore. And I sort of asked that question, where, where are you? And eventually I got to the point where I, I had kind of a miraculous, you know, um, change of heart. And, and I realized that, that he was always there. You know, it's that, that principle of, it's not him that's turning away. It's, it's us. And this, this plea in this song is so beautiful in, in the sense of, you know, guide, guide me to thee, because I know, I know that you're there and your arms are, are outstretched. Um, and uh, wherever we might be, wherever, whatever darkness we might feel ourselves in, that that uh, that He is there. We just we just need to look and open our eyes and see Him. Savior true guide me to thee help me thy will to do guide me i 
That was beautiful. You can, you can see why the Lord told Emma Smith, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me. It's, it's remarkable how music just, just unlocks words and, and makes them more profound as, as a connecting point with heaven as well as with each other. It's almost as if you can hear the angels joining in and adding their, their testimony to what's being sung. If you look at uh, a continuation of some of these ideas in, from chapter 61 into Psalm 62, he says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. I love that, that sentiment tied into what you just sang. 
I, uh, that reminds me of another little story. My, my wife and I had just uh, gotten married in our first ward, and uh, we were going through some of the relationship growing pains that you go through, you know, when you first get married and you're figuring out how to live with an, another person and, you know, the silverware goes in the dishwasher this way and, you know, those types of things, really important. <laughs> Anyways, there, there were a lot of those like little things like whether it's the silverware, like appliances or the colors of the walls. And we, we found ourselves like arguing all the time mm. and to the point where we went and we kind of talked to our bishop. And we we're just like, hey, we just, we just need some advice. You know, we need some help here. <laughs> and the scripture that he read to us was it is upon the rock of our redeemer, you know, that, that we lay our foundation. And he's like. If, if your foundation as a, as a couple is in that, is in the Savior, um, all the other things don't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, the colors of the wall, the, the little knick-knacky things that, that bother us or whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as that is solid, you guys will be just fine. And it was really foundational to our relationship. I love that. You, you mean 10,000 years from now, you won't look back and say, man, I you wish you would have done the wrong. silverware <laughs> this way? You know, it's interesting, too. Like, I, I'm, I'm relating to that because my wife and I now have, you know, been married three and a half years or so. But it's, whether it's from the little things or to the bigger things like purchasing a home and oh, yeah. with all the many changes that are going right, on right now with real estate and the fluctuations, it's so imperative that we have that grounded foundation in our Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we can be like rock steady yeah. in the difficult times and have that faith that even through the difficult times, we can come back to an, a sure place yeah. with him. And isn't that fascinating, the idea of that scripture that your bishop shared with you and that we've been talking about here from Helaman chapter 5, verse 12. It doesn't say, build your foundation upon the rock of the Redeemer and then life's going to be easy. Mm. And you're not going to face adversity or opposition yeah. or difficulty. It's, no, major storms are coming. Yeah. Yes. And they will blow really hard and shafts in the whirlwind are going to come. But if you're built on the rock of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, you shall not fall. You, you will survive this and the storms will pass and you're going to end up being stronger for it. Yeah. I, I love that. I love this concept. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you, you, it ties in here beautifully with verse 7 and 8. He says, in God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Makes you wonder, doesn't it, if, if Helaman chapter 5 is hearkening back to this psalm mm. when he's sitting there teaching his, his two sons. Makes you wonder. Yeah. He's, he's using some of this, this wording here. Look at verse 8. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Beautiful. You know, that, that kind of reminds me of a personal experience of pouring your heart out to God. Um, uh, certainly, it's a lot easier to pour your heart out to God when things are going well. But like you said, both of you said that um, when times get rough, um, I, there was a time where I learned the lesson that that's also an appropriate time and a vital time to share how you feel with God and, and really being honest with Him and yourself. Um, a couple years ago, we were preparing for an upcoming album, which was Prologue correct? Yeah. Um, and uh, I was going to get in the car and I was headed to a songwriting session and we weren't sure what we were going to write yet, um, but we were just going to go and see kind of what's, what stuck. And I pulled out of my driveway and I was almost out of my neighborhood when uh, a melody and some lyrics and some piano, uh, uh, other melodies and chords started coming into my head. And I got really excited, especially as a songwriter, especially since my brain was already in songwriting mode. And I thought, this is, this is amazing. A lot of times, songwriting is a very uh, laborious pro uh, process. And it, it takes a long time to get past all the bad ideas before you get to the good ones. So when lightning strikes and just something just pours into you, uh, it's a really big deal. So I pulled over, uh, and I started singing into my phone. And um, I could just feel the electricity of, I, I knew that there was something special here and I was really excited about it. Um, so I went from really high to um, hitting reality and then falling very low again uh, to my previous state because I remembered that I was, um, I had been angry at God for a couple years at that point and um, I had a hard time forgiving him. 
I felt like he had abandoned me in, in a couple of issues in my life. And so I thought, I knew that this came from God. And I thought, uh, I didn't think it, I yelled it in my car. Um, if this comes with strings attached, I want nothing to do with it. And so if, if, if by receiving this, then that is a symbol of my being okay with you or us being on good terms or me forgiving you, or that, then I, you can take it back and we'll write a different song. Um, but then I had, a, 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 I could feel a, a phrase come into my mind uh, where I felt like God was saying to me that, um, that I didn't need to feel any differently. I could stay angry, that there's no uh, strings attached at all, but instead he just wanted to give me a message. And it actually took me a long time to receive that message. Um, but, but even before I was able to receive it and, and kind of let go and, and, uh, and move forward and mend things with God, there's still something to be said about knowing that he's watching out for me and he's still trying to give me messages uh, to, to guide me along my way. I love that as well because it reminds me that he never, like you said earlier, he never leaves our side. He never leaves us. He's always ready next to us, ready to, to fight with us, to battle with us, to, to comfort us, to, to guide us. Um, he's, he's just the most... Patient, um, patient, <laughs> patient, loving, compassionate. Uh, and I appreciate that, that he, he let me pound on his chest for a while. Yeah. It took years. He can take it. Yeah, he can handle it. And the, and the song that was, that was pouring into to my mind at the time ended up being the song Believe, which we'll be uh, singing for you next. And, and the, the last part of the chorus in there uh, says, uh, you're not alone, keep holding on and believe. Ready? 
to lift you up and carry you back to safety. You're not alone. Keep holding on and believe. Mm -hmm. Believe. You know, one of the amazing things about that song you just sang is the, the word believe is very agency based. It's very action oriented. It's not sit back and wait for belief somewhere in the universe to come mm. and hit you mm. and descend upon you and change you. It's a choice. Mm. And the, the story you shared, Stephen, it's, it's inspiring that God gave that to you, not on a mountain peak, of spirituality and connection with God, but in a trough, when it's the very hardest to believe, when it's, when it's so difficult to, to rely on him, because you can't see him, you can't hear him, you, you, you can't see his hand, and for, for any who are struggling through one of those troughs, troughs of life right now, the, the words to this song are really, really profound. It's a choice. And we can make it. And quite frankly, I think we stand to gain greater spiritual growth if we can choose to believe when we've got nothing to go on, mm -hmm. nothing to seemingly hold on to, compared to when the sun's shining, mm -hmm. the birds yeah. are singing, the angels are almost visible. It's, it's, a, it's a profound decision that we get to make. It reminds me of... Uh the quote from President Nelson, the Lord loves effort, you know, as small as it might be, especially in my case, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. just yeah. do something, even in, even in those troughs, even, even in those low points, just, just do something, just try. Yeah. So, so that <clears throat> ties in beautifully with Psalm 63. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Does that kind of describe what we've been talking about, these, these troughs? To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Again, these are all choices that we get to make. These aren't things that are, that are just going to come out of the blue and hit us against our will. Th these are decisions that we're making. All right, let's shift gears over to Psalm 66. Gentry would obviously love this first verse. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. 
So I'm really curious what your experience has been singing in different venues to different audiences, different uh, types of songs. Well, the first thing I'll say, I think those joyful noises are referring to three-part harmony and not our vocal warm-ups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah. which yeah. could be the furthest thing from a joyful noise. That's good. What's, what's great about this group in particular is even when we're not uh, in a spiritual setting or whatnot, I think our hearts are, are still in that same place. Mm. We're offering our hearts on any stage that we're on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it so special to be a part of this group. And yeah. I don't know, what, what, wouldn't you say the same? Yeah, I remember, um, where were we? Where that, that gentleman came backstage after and he was so moved by our song One. Uh, Arkansas. Yeah. yeah, I remember him just coming back and he had tears in his eyes and, and he was just so impacted by the, the song that we had, had written and it was like, it's not a re religious song, so to speak, but to your point, I think because of our convictions and our, our foundation in Christ, we approach everything we do with that same spirit and I, I think that, you know, it reaches people. But that being said, singing some of these hymns is yeah. so satisfying to us. I think maybe that's why Christmas. one of the reasons we love Christmas. We love so Christmas. Because <laughs> it's the one time of year where, where we can, we, the whole show can be that, yep. you know? Um, and, it's, and it's totally fine. People just are okay with it. That's you know? what they came to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they want it. Yeah. Well, and these guys have heard this story before, but um, back in 2008, um, I, I participated in a regional production of a, of a probably a lesser known musical, unless you're really into musical theater, called Civil War. Mm -hmm. And what was particularly interesting about that, besides just the, the opportunity to tell the story of, of a really important part of our country's history, the, uh, the star actor in that production was Merrill Osmond, one of the original mm -hmm. Osmond brothers. Yeah. And it just so happened that, that I, I was in the same dressing room as him, him and, and probably four or five other guys. And when you do a show, as we know, uh, over the course of months and months, you get to know the people in your dressing room very, very well, because you, you just talk about everything. And one day, uh, Meryl turns to us, just out of the blue, like I think like another song or part of the show is going on, and we just happen to be in our dressing room. And he's like, do you guys know why music's so powerful? And it's like, I mean, as someone who's been in the industry for 50 years, I'm sure you could tell us. <laughs> And he said, it's because it has the ability to bypass the conscious and speak directly to the subconscious. And as we were, as we were forming the group and trying to decide like our brand, our image, the things we want to sing about and write about, that, that quote uh, moment with Merrill instantly came back. And I think the reason is because as an artist, as a, as a musician, and frankly, as a human being, as you go out and you present yourself into the world, you are always selling something. And, and as, as we kind of realized our responsibility, not even knowing to what degree our music would, would touch people. Was it gonna go down the street? Was it gonna go around the world? We had no idea. But what we did know is that we, we had a responsibility to put out into the world uh, something good, something uplifting, something edifying, or as we talked about earlier uh, in the conversation, something that could nourish the soul, that could, that could fulfill and keep someone seeking that, that light satiated. I love that, Brett. It, it reminds me of this idea of, that you had brought up earlier um, from In the Bleak Midwinter of what, what do I have to give him? God's given you a gift. And it's amazing to watch as people recognize gifts given by God and they place them on the altar with no strings attached from our end to say, Lord, I'm, I'm giving this take it, touch it, make it shine, do whatever you want with it. And in the process, he multiplies the harvest. He touches lives and goes deep into hearts where none of us can ever hope to, to touch. Yeah. But he does through that consecrated effort. It's beautiful. Yeah, he touches our hearts and they begin to stir. And I'll speak for myself, but I think you guys can probably agree that uh, we've each individually felt the the stirring power of the atonement in our lives, which has caused us 
to just want to sing and share that redeeming <laughs> love and the, what, the change within us that, is, mm -hmm. that has occurred. And so I love that it says it so many times in the scriptures to sing that song. Yeah. How, how can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? <laughs> I love it. Which you've led us into Psalm 69 very beautifully. Verse 1. This, is, this whole psalm is a very poignant messianic psalm where David is writing, but it's almost as if these are the words of, of the Savior himself. Listen to this. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. We now get into this segment here where you can picture the agonies of the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ, the price, the terrible price that he had to pay for us. And listen to these words. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. You can almost hear that, that plea from the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now we jump down to verse 20. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. I guess the point here is if, if we ever get into a stage of life where we feel cut off from God, where we feel forsaken, left alone, uh, abused by the world, there's, there really is one person who fully gets us, who completely understands what we're going through uh, because of what he endured in his infinite atonement and those agonies. Um, it's that, that heartfelt plea of, O oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? I need thee desperately now. And the, the song that you're, you're gonna sing now, I think encapsulates that idea profoundly.
That song means a lot to me. Uh, I'll never forget day two of my mission down in Brazil. I had arrived, you know, you, you get to that point where you've spent two months in the MTC and you're like, let me go to Brazil, I'm ready, let's go. And then I got to Brazil and thought, what in the world have I gotten myself into? How do I get back to the MTC? I, I'd much rather go back and it was it was painful as I had two years staring me in the face at that point. And uh, I'll never forget that day, uh, two days in with, with serious heartache and homesickness and struggle thinking, I, I can't do this. And my companion, Elder Pratt, was the zone leader and he had to go in and get on the phone to call all the members of the zone to get the numbers. And he told me, you can go into the chapel and study, read your scriptures. I went to the piano and I sat down and I poured my heart out to God. And this was one of the songs that I played repeatedly. And it was salve to my, my hurting soul at that point. And it gave me that strength. Be still my soul. It's gonna be okay because you're not alone. The Lord is on thy side. And such a profound uh, sentiment that has gotten me through not just that experience, but countless other times in my life. So thank you. The song means a lot. I just think that's a beautiful reminder as well uh, for the future because, you know, things aren't going to get easier. 
in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just yeah. to remember that uh, we can find calm in the storm. You mean, you mean, I haven't passed through those experiences and now it's smooth sailing from yeah. here to the end? <laughs> we like to hope. Yeah, that's what, right? I, that's what I tell myself every yeah. day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that line in that song, uh, to guide thy future as he has the past. It's those, he gives us those anchor points in the past to, to you know, buoy up our faith and our hope and, and our trust in him. Because we know there's stormy water ahead. There, there are difficulties ahead. Now we jump over to Psalm 77. And this is, it's an interesting psalm because every once in a while scripture writers will, will shift into this asking rhetorical questions or asking, asking you to contemplate some things, but they do it in sometimes the, the negative perspective so that you see the, the struggle of humanity from a different angle. Listen to these words. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My, my sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. And so it's this idea of everything's great, right? Well, then, then something shifts. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart and my spirit made diligent search. So now it's this, it's this soul searching element that is loaded with questions. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will, will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? So it's this whole series of questions like, uh, am I going to be okay? Mm -hmm. And then he answers, and I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Every time in scripture, especially ancient scripture, where it refers to the right hand of the Lord, it's always an extension of God's mercy, his kindness, his loving tenderness. Uh, if it's his left hand, that's punishment. That's justice. That's judgment. You don't want the left hand. Mm -hmm. If the Lord taps you on the shoulder, you, you want to turn and hope to see his <laughs> right hand. <laughs> and, and that's his response here. Now look at verse 11. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. Don't you love that? How he, he, he says, if you're struggling right now, maybe the way that you can still your soul is to look to the past and to look for the hand of God where he's guided you in the past and it'll strengthen you for the present and prepare you for the future. I, I love that. <clears throat> I was actually just talking with my wife about this the other day that, that uh, it's so easy to forget, you know, when, we, when, we're not, when we're not keeping sort of the past in our present mind and what we've learned in the past and the spiritual experiences that we had, we've had in the past, um, they they leave our memory. You know, they they leave um, they they no longer have influence on us, and uh, and so I think that's we were talking about in the context of, of journal writing and keeping a record mm -hmm. and how important that is because we just tend to forget, you know, and yet we can benefit so much from what we've already come through and the trials we've come through and gotten through and all those things. I, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to, how to communicate this, but this, this concept of that we're his sons and daughters is a powerful one to remember because we're ever learning, ever growing. Um, and and I, I, think I bring that up because I think there, uh, when we look to the past sometimes, it's not always bright. And again, I'm not sure how to communicate this, uh, but there's fatherlessness in the world today. Yeah. And um, I think sometimes we view uh, our loving Heavenly Father through the lens of our earthly father. Now, I have a wonderful father. He is an amazing person, amazing dad. But um, he's not perfect, and I'm not perfect. But uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is he is, our Heavenly Father is perfect in his love for us and in his patience for us, mm -hmm. and in the way he teaches us. 
you know? Yeah. So just remember that, that even if our past isn't bright and it's, it's not a, we can always learn from it. Yeah. But um, sometimes the, path doesn't, the past doesn't give us strength, but we can, we can turn that into a strength with, with the Savior's help. It reminds help. me of uh, something that S. Michael Wilcox said about how the Lord takes, takes the negatives and turns them into positives. You know, so it's like even the negative things that we go through when we, when we stick with God, you know, when we don't give up on God, he will take all those negatives and turn them into positives. And, uh, yeah, it's a huge lesson. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, we're talking about God, the, the ruler of the universe here, who has infinite capacity, infinite power. He could make our lives so easy, so comfortable, so pain-free, but he doesn't. He could, he could take away all doubts, all fears, all anxieties, all diseases, all infirmities of every kind, mental, emotional, psychological, physical, spiritual. He could take them away, but he doesn't. There's something that we learn through those difficult experiences, whether they're in the past or the present or the future, that it's as if he's saying, my son or my daughter, I need you to learn some things about yourself, about other people, and most importantly about me. And the smartest being in the universe has sent us down here and allows us to go through these difficulties. Apparently, that's the best curriculum for learning those lessons. And, and it's this line upon line, step by step, and when we fall and we struggle even sometimes for years or decades, he seems to be okay with this process because the Lord Jesus Christ has performed that infinite atonement for us to, to make every wrong right eventually. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but we really can sing those words, be still my soul, thy God is on thy side. It's gonna be okay if we stick with him. Sometimes in, in life and in our families and in, in church settings, we, we speak in a sanitized way of, oh, everything's good, nothing, nothing to see here, everything's perfect, when in reality, life's messy, and it gets really muddy sometimes, and, and the past isn't perfect for everybody. That's an important reminder to, to, to keep in, in mind. Yeah. Without that resistance, there's no way to gain strength. You know, uh, a quote that comes to mind is, is one of my favorites. Um, we all, we all love Elder Holland and the power that he delivers his messages. And one time in one of his talks, he said, if, if sometimes the, the harder you try, the harder it gets, so it was with the best people who ever lived. Oh, or I something love that. Like that. Yeah, I remember that. And, and you think about um, any, any of the, the, the Lord's chosen, the prophets, uh, the amazing men and women of the scriptures. One of, one of the things they all have in common is life was hard. They went through tribulation. Yeah, yeah a lot of them. It's, uh, you know, and, and, and I think that's just, it's just the refiner's fire. It, it is, it is a, a reality of mortality. We, we were here to learn by our own experience. And, and it's just not the same when, when someone tells you something about how hard something was or how mm. they overcame or how they came to know for themselves. It is, it is completely different to walk through that yourself. So jumping to our last Psalm for today, Psalm 86. I think this is a a fitting place to end. Verse 12, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. And then jumping down to verse 15, but thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Um, I love this idea of we could, we could stay in the, the mire pit of mortality and all complaining about how bad everything is, but I love how the Psalms keep pulling us up to these mountain peaks of it's gonna be okay. It's, we're going to get through this because God is on our side and he's merciful, he's gracious, and he happens to love you because he's your 
he's your father and he cares about you as only a parent can care about a child. This has been a delight. We can't thank you enough for sharing your, your time, these beautiful talents with everybody, and uh, your testimony of God's goodness. It, it's wonderful to have people that you, you feel this fellowship in the Lord as we're all doing whatever we can in whatever capacities we have to be able to help push the work forward and build the kingdom and build people's faith in God and confidence. So thank you sincerely for, for joining us for this episode. It's been a delight. Well, likewise, thank you for what you guys do. And, and uh, yeah, like you said, we all, we all participate and bring what we have and gifts mm -hmm. and talents that we have to, to do the same thing, you know, to, to push the work forward. So thank you. And we all feel edified with yeah. this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, to close off this episode, um, Gentry's going to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Listen carefully to these words. It's a powerful way to finish off Psalm 49 through 86. And we leave this message with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. Here's
my heart. 